our next pair of speakers, I'm starting to detect a little bit of a pattern. Yesterday, Ernie Miller was talking about quantum physics as part of his talk. And there seems to be something with rubies that transition into elixir one way or the other. They seem to also pick up some physics along the way. <laughs> this talk is going to be about string theory. I expect particle collisions of all sorts. And what can I say about our two speakers? Well, when it comes to James, he's currently building his own, very own castle grey skull. Yeah, that's worth a round of applause, I think. Yeah. <laughs> and Nathan, well, he's not only a developer, he has actually a past in helping President Obama counter terrorists using hashes. <laughs> Please welcome to the stage James and Nathan. This talk is uh, not going to really have much to do with physics. I, as far as I know, string theory is something about knitting. I, I don't really know. <coughs> Basically, it's a play. So um, what we are going to talk about is um, all of the different stringy types in Elixir, including IO lists and atoms and fun stuff like that. Um, I've never met this guy before, so hopefully this is going to go well. I'm James Gray. I work for No Red Ink. We have Elixir in production, and we're hiring. <laughs> and I'm Nathan Long. I work for Big Nerd Ranch, and we would love to help you with your Elixir uh, projects. Uh, we're not actually going to do Q&A in this session. If you have questions, you can grab us afterwards or start a post on Elixir form and ping us about it. Nathan and I have been friends for a long time, so we have these conversations with each other regularly. And uh, I just want you to pay attention because I'm pretty sure when we divided up this talk, somehow I ended up with sections that look like naming things and cache invalidation. So I'm not really sure what's going on there. When I was on the Ruby Rogues podcast, we spent a lot of time trying to get our definitions right. It kind of became the running gag of, of our uh, show. And here I am trying to get the definitions right so we can actually talk about this stuff. Uh, but that's what we're going to do. So there's lots of different kinds of strings in Elixir. The first one is the single quoted string, which is different from the double quoted string. It produces a list of integers that represent code points uh, for that data. This is primarily for compatibility with Erlang, which will generally return strings in this format. So uh, it's not something you'll typically use in uh, straight up Elixir code. Mostly uh, you'll get these back from Erlang or you'll be sending these to Erlang. There's another kind of, kind of stringy-like thing, uh, and that's the atom with colon and some characters after it. And the reason that this exists is an atom is just a name in a table somewhere and a number that points to that name. So uh, when comparing atoms for equality, it's extremely fast because you just have to compare numbers and see if they're the same. And as you will get into a bit later, comparing strings in the same manner is much more complicated. Beware of atoms, they're not garbage collected in the beam. So if you do something dynamic, like convert every incoming parameter to an atom, you open yourself up to denial of service attacks. You can exhaust the atom table and then the beam will crash. Um, a way to work around this is you could use the two existing atom converter, which will only convert it if it already exists in your program. Okay, now to the double quoted stringy th type things, uh, of which there are three. A bit string is just a sequence of ones and zeros between the double angle brackets. So anything between double angle brackets is a bit string. Binaries are bit strings that happen to be in 8-bit or byte chunks. 
So uh, if you're dealing with bytes, then it's a binary. If your binary's bytes happen to represent UTF-8 code points, then you can refer to it as a string. This is Elixir's double-coded string, right? The normal string. Okay, so these are kind of like subsets of each other. Bit strings is everything. Binaries are when the length is evenly divisible by eight, and uh, strings are UTF-8 encoded binaries. They're subsets of each other. Now I'm gonna introduce one more data type here, and this one is a little bit trickier to uh, get, get your head around, so I'm gonna kind of uh, see if I can walk us into the definition. So let's say we wanted to print out three strings. One way we could do it, and a way we have to do it in a lot of languages, is we could concatenate them all together. This would create a fourth string, and there would be a lot of memory copying, right? We've gotta copy the first one in, the second one in, the third one in. We could do this with interpolation. This is just a syntax trick. It's still the same thing under the hood. We're still building the fourth string. We're still doing some memory copying. Elixir lets us instead use lists. Uh, we could send the data to puts via a list. And in this case, we're not actually building a fourth string. We are allocating some small pointers for the list, right? But they in turn point directly at the existing binaries. So we didn't have to copy memory around and stuff like that. We saved a little bit uh, in using these lists. And if you think about this, right, a link list is a head that points at some data and a tail that typically points at another list. So we've actually got like four lists here, right? One with James at the head, one with Anne at the head, one with Nathan at the head, and the empty list at the end. We can actually make it less if we use some kind of strange nesting and stop using proper lists. Now we're down to two lists, right, to represent the same data. We've cut it in half. And this format may seem a little strange, but it's actually very quick to append to which is a problem that lists usually have, right? If we use the list concatenation operator, it's big O of N every time we call it. We have to clock the entire list to put something on the end. But using this improper format, we can add very quickly to the end, right, with big O of one. Uh, you end up with this strange nested structure, but uh, Elixir's IO methods don't care that you give it this strange nested structure. So I've told you these are called I.O. lists, and if you go look up I.O. puts in the documentation, it's gonna tell you it takes a care data uh, argument. So you probably think I'm lying, and the answer is it gets pretty complicated to sort this stuff out. <laughs> um, if you read Elixir for them, you can actually go back and uh, look at me trying to sort this out, and I got lots of really helpful information uh, from many members of the community, including Jose Valim and Robert Verding, one of the co-creators of Erlang. Uh, and then after they were done helping me, they hijacked my thread to debate the uh, best ways to implement strings in a programming language. So uh, it gets pretty confusing. But this is my best attempt at uh, solidifying all the definitions of things here. The first three are those subsets of double-quoted strings that we discussed before. Care list is your compatibility string, your single-quoted compatibility string. IO list, IO data, and care data are all quasi-related to each other. The main difference is that care data has that UTF-8 code point assumption in it that IO list does not. And the reason I introduce them to you as IO list is if you look at blog posts and other materials, that is typically the name that gets thrown around. So this care data is not as Googleable, in my opinion. So we're gonna talk about UTF-8 uh, strings, Unicode. Um, if you're anything like me, possibly, possibly your first introduction to Unicode was stuff not working in a web page. So before we talk about Unicode, let's talk about ASCII. Um, if I run man ASCII on my computer, I get this. And 
What this shows me is that ASCII is just a mapping. It's here's a bunch of characters we want to be able to type, and we're going to assign each, of, each one of them a number. So here's our beloved alphabet. Um, and uh, if you want to encode ASCII in a way that lets you store it on a disk, all you do is take that number that, uh, that it's assigned and convert that to base 2 or binary. And you can store that on a disk, you can transmit that over a network, and it's pretty simple. Um, what's interesting is all of the ASCII characters will fit in a single byte because there aren't that many of them. So you can see that the, the red zero is there to tell you, hey, look, this is empty. It's always going to be empty. Um, but Unicode wants to let us type a lot more than those characters that we Americans uh, uh, were typing in the 70s. We want to be able to type, uh, you know, accented letters. We want to be able to type Greek letters. And we want to be able to type this Han character that means to castrate a foul. <laughs> we want to be able to type more than words also. We want to be able to type pictures, right? <laughs> we want to be able to, uh, we want to be able to do a lot of things. We want to be able to have emoji for laughing and crying and being upside down and having dollars in our mouth. <laughs> so Unicode lets us do all these things. Now exactly what gets included in the Unicode standard is kind of a political thing. And some people have felt like they got, you know, short shift. So for example, there's a thing called the Han unification, whereby um, people who type Japanese and Chinese and Korean have been asked to share some characters uh, ostensibly to save space in the Unicode standard. Even though Unicode did see fit to include playing cards and alchemy symbols, and ancient Greek musical notation. <laughs> and they're adding linear B, which only scholars would ever type. So you can see why they're miffed. But in the end, what's important for us is that this is just a mapping. So we can include anything we want to. In theory, uh, uh, we can fit all human characters in here. So we're just saying, look, we've got capital A, we've got lowercase lambda, we've got man in a business suit levitating, and <laughs> each of these is assigned a number. We have a mapping number character. And now, once we have this mapping, we have, you know, here's what it should generally look like. Font designers, please go include this in your font if you really want to. So there's a lot of code points in Unicode. There's, there's somewhere around a million. And obviously, they're not all going to fit in one byte. You can see that this, uh, this our, our, our beloved Han character here takes up a good bit more than one byte. Some code points are going to need more bytes than others. So how do we handle that? We could say, uh, well, we'll just give all of them four bytes so that we know how long uh, each code point is, and, and there you go. But that's not great, right? Because then the letter A is going to take up four bytes when it could have been one. It's not very efficient. So the going solution these days is called UTF-8. And what it does is it gives us, um, this is an encoding for Unicode. You take your code point, and you're going to encode it into one of these four templates. There's a one-byte template, a two-byte template, all the way up to the four-byte template. So you take your, um, the binary that you need and you slot it into one of these templates, the smallest one that you can, you can get it in. So let's see an example of how this works. So here's the clock character. That happens to be code point 9200. If you, if you give any character after a question mark like, th like this in IEX, it's going to tell you the code point for it. So the code point is 9200. That's the number that that character is assigned. If I convert that to base 2, those are the bits we need. That's, that's uh, the, the bare minimum that we have to encode somehow. So the way we put that in UTF-8 is like this. We just divide it up and slot it into the, uh, uh, the non-header parts of the template and pad with zeros on the left, and there you go. That's what we have. Um, there's some really cool things about UTF-8 encoding um, that it enables, but first let's see if this is what Elixir actually does. So, if I use the I helper, the I helper is great in IEX, by the way, to inspect any piece of data, you should, you should use it. If I use the I helper on this string, it tells me that the raw representation, what's in the binary, is these three numbers, 226, 143, 176. If we map over those and convert them to base 2, hey, that kind of looks like UTF-8, doesn't it? It looks exactly like UTF-8, because that's what it is. <laughs> that's, that's how Elixir stores this stuff internally. Um, so let's, let's take a look at um, what UTF-8 is actually doing. The cool thing is that there are three kinds of bytes in UTF-8. Uh, so there's a solo byte, like we saw with ASCII characters like A, that first uh, bit is always zero. And the reason is because we don't, we don't need all that space. And um, UTF-8 is backwards compatible with ASCII. Whatever something is in ASCII, it's going to be the same in UTF-8, which is handy for those of us who uh, are uh, American and want it to be the same as when we typed it in the 70s. Um, so we have solo bytes. We have continuation bytes. Any byte that starts with one zero says, I'm following after this other one. <laughs> and then we have first of n bytes. So 
If it starts with 110, it's saying, I'm a two byte, I'm a two byte sequence of code points. If it starts with 1110, it says, I'm a three byte sequence of code points, I'm the first one. So, you know, if you look at these two characters, the A, you can see it's a solo byte, starts with zero. And this roasted sweet potato character uh, <laughs> begins with a, a four byte uh, header. It says, hey, I'm four bytes long, and then you can see the, the three continuation bytes. So this is cool because it enables, to do, it enables us to do things like string reversal correctly. If you have a string that looks like this, you have a single character followed by, a single code point character followed by a three code point character, and you want to reverse it, you would not do this. This would be terrible, right? You've scram if you do this, you've scrambled that first character, or, or what was the second character, um, because its bytes, got, its bytes got reversed. That would be a bad reversing algorithm. Instead, you want to do this. You want to keep that, that three code point character, or the, uh, Intact the not three code, the three byte character intact and uh, the solo put the solo one after it. So, but it gets even more complicated because not only do we have multi byte code points, we have multi code point graphemes. So, a grapheme is what a human being would consider generally a written character on the screen. And some characters can be written with multiple code points, like this E with an accent can be written as here's an E and then here's the accent that goes on it. Those are two different code points. That's called combining diacritical marks. Um, so here's an example, Noel, N-O-E, and then we have this, here's a combining diacritical mark to go on the E, L. If you ask Elixir, give me the code points for this, you get five code points out, and hilariously, the uh, display of that puts the <laughs> accent mark on the quotation, which is uh, pretty broken. And if you ask for graphemes out of that, then you get uh, what you would actually consider the characters, uh, the, like a human being would consider the graphemes to be the characters. So you may wonder, if you can stick diacritical marks on something, how many can you stick on there? Can you stick as many as you want? And the answer is, yes, you can. <laughs> this is called Zalgotext, and it's horrible. Um, you may see things on, like this on the internet. You may see questions on Stack Overflow where people ask, how can I prevent users from doing this to my web page? And you may see snarky remarks where people do it to them. <laughs> And the answer is, you cannot prevent users from doing this to your web page. It is not a bug. It is a feature. <laughs> because there are actually languages that need this kind of thing. Like, these folks from Peru are, have a tonal language, and they want to be able to put multiple marks on letters in order to represent those tones. So deal with it. <laughs> uh, the best thing you can do is, if you think it's unreasonable to have like, uh, you know, a giant column of those characters, maybe you can use CSS to hide some of them. Uh, but Unicode is there to support this kind of thing and not to prevent it. So uh, all, of this, uh, all of this complication makes strings pretty uh, difficult to deal with. So traversing strings, asking for the length of a string becomes difficult because in order to find out how long a string is in terms of graphemes, you have to walk through that string, combine the bytes into code points, and combine the code points into graphemes, and then say, okay, how many graphemes did I get? <laughs> um, if you want to index into a string and say, give me from the second character to the third character, well, if you want from the second grapheme to the third grapheme, you're going to have to walk through and figure that out. That's all O of N operations. Length is uh, ambiguous. You have, to, you have to specify, do you want how many bytes are in this, or do you want how many graphemes are in this? String.length in Elixir is going to give you the grapheme count. But again, that's O of N. Reversal can be tricky, because uh, when you reverse, you, again, you have to be thinking in graphemes. Like, if you look at the the, the Elixir example here does this correctly, but the Ruby example messes that up. It, it, it reverses the code points, but the uh, accent mark ends up being on the L. Equality is tricky because, hey, sometimes there's more than one way to write something. Um, you can have E with an accent written as uh, a single character, a single code point, or you can have it written as an E followed by a combining mark code point. And if you ask if those are equal, they're not equal. They don't have the same bytes in them. But if you want to know if they're equivalent, Elixir has a method for that. So it kind of converts it into some canonical representation and then compares them. So a string dot equivalent is your friend if you're dealing with UCF8 strings uh, and anything with uh, international kinds of characters and whatnot. Casing can be tricky. Uh, even though casing is implemented via basically a case statement, we say, hey, uh, what's, the, what's the uppercase version of this character or whatever? Um, a lot of languages do this wrong until the actually the upcoming release of Ruby uh, they're still getting this wrong right now. Um, and even Elixir, which, which has a really nice case statement in the form of a bunch of function heads matching to do, this, to, do, to do this operation, doesn't get everything perfect because human language is ridiculously complicated and can't be tamed. Um, <laughs> this this uh, uh, sigma character, when you downcase it, 
according to uh, the actual grammatical rules, has to be down case differently whether it's at the end of a word or not. And Elixir doesn't have that. <laughs> Elixir just says, look, here's the down case, all right? If you need to do it uh, more correctly for Greek, then write your own function. If you get only one thing out of this talk, I hope it's that there's an emoji for a man in a business suit levitating. <laughs> Is that not the most amazing thing ever? I don't know, it's pretty cool. Also, his section is funnier than mine. Did you notice that? <laughs> Pretty sure this division was not fair. <laughs> We're going to revisit our friendship after this. OK, so let's do cache invalidation. The beam has certain rules, right? Processes are isolated. Data is immutable. And therefore, if you send a message from one process to another, we do a full memory copy of the message because we have to move it into the new memory space, right? Because of this, there exists some optimizations in the beam. The beam actually has a handful of different types of binaries, but here we're primarily concerned with two categories. So if your binary is small, under 64 bytes, it's allocated on your processes heap like all other data types, so lists or whatever and garbage collected off of that heap normally. If it's larger than that, it's actually stored in a space called the large binary space. And internally, you just get a tiny reference to this external data. So you're probably wondering, uh, why are we talking about this? It seems like a strange implementation detail. And the answer is because it's awesome, right up until the point where it causes you horrible problems. Um, so we probably want to be aware of this so you can understand what it's doing for you and what it's doing to you. So the win is this. Uh, if you are passing binaries between processes that are big, it's very fast because you only have to copy these tiny references and it's just super quick. And it makes sense that we would be passing large binaries uh, between processes a lot. Think about like HTTP responses. You know, if you fetch some data off of a JSON API, it's a giant wall, you know, of, of data. Uh, if we do, uh, you know, rendered sections of Phoenix templates, they're going to be big chunks of HTML boilerplate in there and stuff. So we do this a lot, and it's good for this to be fast. But here's the problem. It exists outside of processes. Therefore, it can't be garbage collected normally like the stuff in processes. So it has to be reference counted. Every time we allocate one of those tiny little references, the counter goes up. Every time one of those tiny little references is garbage collected, the counter goes down. If the counter hits zero, then we can get rid of that thing that's stored externally, right? But what if your process doesn't hit garbage collection for a long period of time. It's possible for this to happen, right? If you built some system that was pulling data off of the web or something and then sending it through a process that just looked in that giant text for the three things you care about and found them, if you don't do much memory allocation in that sequence, you may not get to the point where you need to get garbage collected. And so those references would stick around and keep that data alive in the large binary space. If this happens, you might begin to see things like memory leaks over time. And if you take it to extreme scenarios, it will actually crash the beam. So uh, this can be a big problem. It's affected people uh, very really. Heroku has this great write-up of them trying to find it in one of their uh, products, Log Dash, I think. And it's like a long six month search of them figuring out what's going on, trying to find ways around it, and, and um, things like that. Avdi Grimm, who you probably know from the Ruby community, came and checked out Elixir for a time. He ran into this issue and got real frustrated with uh, both figuring it out and uh, what to do about it and we kind of ran him off. So it's something uh, you know we have to stay aware of and uh, know what's going on. So here's one way you might be able to find it. Erlang keeps track of memory that it allocates in various areas. 
And this particular code will ask you what the allocation is for the large binary space. This code is a little bit uh, tricky. I can't seem to get it to work in IEX, uh, for example, but uh, it does work in the general case. Also, I believe Observer has the same information in it under the Allocators tab, so you can choose to look it up there as well. If you do start seeing these problems, uh, what you should do about it is also a bit of an open question. Some recommend that you manually force garbage collection in key places um, where you think the problem is happening. That's definitely a dark art because you have to find the right places and the right time to force it. And we're talking about a generational garbage collector here, so not all garbage collections are created equal. They don't all visit all the bits of allocated memory. So uh, there's a bit of trickiness to getting this right and finding what works. One idea I, I've had uh, is that I, it may be better to have your processes live shorter periods of time, right? The best garbage collection is to exit, right? Then you're not holding any more memory. So in that example I gave before, if you're, uh, you know, have a process that's analyzing incoming data over time, maybe it's better to spin up a process, analyze a particular chunk of data, have that process exit. When the next one comes in, spin up a fresh process, analyze that data, and do it that way. That way you won't have these long-lived references to that data and uh, you, hopefully the large binary space will get cleaned up more often. So James uh, talked a little bit about IO lists and um, uh, just to kind of give you a quick refresher of what they are. So if I do this, this puts with an explicit concatenation, we get out what you'd expect. I can also do the IO puts with uh, a list of strings I can put a code point in there and we get the nice snowman. Um, and I can give it this deeply nested list of strings and that all works just fine. It all, it all comes out just as if I had given it a single concatenated string. So IO lists, when you're doing IO operations like um, putting the standard out, writing to a file, writing to a socket, um, stuff that goes outside of your program, uh, it, uh, it, it's gonna be able to use IO lists just as well as if you built this, uh, the final string yourself. So this enables some cool things. It enables things like string reuse. So if I want to build up an output that has uh, users' names wrapped in li tags, then uh, I can do this, uh, where I've allocated these strings and just keep putting references to them again in lists, and I'm not copying those li tags uh, into new strings over and over again. I'm just referencing them as needed. Um, and then when I do the puts, it's gonna come out just as if I had copied those strings. So that's cool. So the benefits of string reuse, one is that we skip doing the work of concatenation, of continually allocating this new string and copying characters from one place to another. Um, we also, the fact that we're not allocating those strings means we use less memory, and the fact that we're not allocating those means we let, uh, have fewer things to garbage collect, so that's less garbage collection work. So that's all cool. Um, IO lists are for IO, like I mentioned. This is anything your process is doing to talk with the outside world. So writing to a file and sending data over the network are, are probably the big ones. So let's talk about system calls. System calls are, are things that allow your program to do things that normally the operating system manages. So we can say, dear operating system, please write this data to a file for me. And the operating system will take care of that for you. And, and you don't, your program doesn't have to know the details of, well, how do I get in touch with the disk and what kinds of, like, what, you know, what, what uh, protocol does it expect me to speak and all that kind of stuff, right? The operating system handles that for you. Um, so there are actually different system calls that can be used to write data to a disk or a socket. So one of them is write, as uh, you know, very straightforward. It just writes the data. Um, and, and the way write works is it will say, um, please go to this address in memory for me and pull this many bytes out of it and write it to wherever, whatever I'm trying to write it to. And, op and the operating system will do that for you. Write V, the V is for vector. So it's a list of things. Um, and we can say, please uh, write this item and this item and this item. Um, and we give it addresses for each one. So here's a code sample where we're gonna take advantage of these things. I'm gonna, in the first line, I'm opening a file. I'm using the Erlang file open uh, uh, function. And it's important that I'm passing raw. I'm not gonna go into all the details of what that means, but I'm opening this file in raw mode. Then I'm gonna allocate a couple of strings. 
I make a list that has those strings in it, the, the foo string is repeated, and then I'm going to join those into one big fat string at the end and then write it to the file. Now, I'm, I'm using a dtrace script um, that I got from uh, Evan Miller's uh, blog post, uh, Elixir and the Template of Doom, which is a great blog post you should read. Um, and using that dtrace script, I can see the system call that's being used here. It says, go to this address in memory and write nine bytes for me. And the foobar foo that you see there is just, just for us. Like, that's for us to see as humans from the dtrace script. It's, it's not actually part of the system call. Um, now watch what happens. See the line where I'm concatting those strings together, enum.join output? I'm going to comment that out and watch what happens. All of a sudden, we're now using writev. Um, and writev says, go to this first address, write three bytes. Go to this other address, write three bytes, and go back to the first address again and write three more bytes. So this is actually really cool, because if you think about what's happening, I'm never in my program ever building the completed output. The, the contents, of, the ultimate contents of the file never exist in my program. The only place they ever exist is in the file I'm writing to. Um, so I didn't have to allocate the full contents of that file. Imagine that was going to be like a multi-gigabyte file where a lot of the stuff was repeated. I never had to allocate that. It just gets, uh, it just gets put into the file. So this is really cool. So what kind of I.O. operations has a lot of repetitive strings? Hey, HTML has a lot of repetitive strings, right? When we're doing web responses, we'll have snippets that are repeated in the page, like an li tag that you have over and over. Uh, and we're going to have chunks that might be repeated not only within the page, but across web requests. Every time somebody requests your web page, they may be getting the exact same footer as the last person who, who, who made a request. So it would be nice if we didn't have to repeat those. Um, if you are using Phoenix and EX, or uh, if you're using um, Hamel with the Calipi uh, library, um, you're going to get to take advantage of this. So here's an example in a template. Um, you can see the chunks of, um, uh, you, can see, you can see all in, in, this, in this page, we've got some static pieces of information, like the listing users, that's going to be the same on every request. And then we've got some dynamic things, like where we're iterating through people's names. Um, all of these things are static, right? They're, they're, not, they're not changing. So it'd be nice if we didn't have to keep building those strings. Well, in fact, you don't have to. This is what happens when you use Phoenix. So uh, you have a template like foo.html.ex. Phoenix is going to find that uh, as it's booting up. And it's going to compile that into a function. It's going to use EEX uh, to compile that to a function. And it's going to pass something to EEX to say, um, by the way, as, you, as, you're, um, can, as you're building up the output from this template, don't build it up by concatting into a big string. Build it up by building an I.O. list for me. Um, Phoenix specifies that for it. And so this is going to be compiled to a function head on your view, like my view.render matching foo.html uh, and you know, taking the assigns. And that function is going to be ready to return I.O. lists. And so all of those static pieces that were in your template are just going to be sitting there in a structure in that, inside of that function waiting to, be, uh, waiting to have the dynamic bits added in. So the, the I.O. list that's returned from that function is going to look something like this. So you can see it has very much the same structure as the template. And uh, the listing users is just going to be the same string every single time that this function returns. It's going to be a pointer to the same string. So this is really neat because it enables a really simple caching strategy. You may have worked with web frameworks that um, you have like a, a, a caching strategy where you have to say, this piece of the page can be cached if this model's updated at hasn't changed. And by the way, this model depends on this other model, so if that one gets updated, make sure and update this one so that this, you know, the, the, the piece of the page will get updated as it needs to be. Um, this is a really simple strategy. Everything that's static in your template is cached. Everything that's dynamic in your template is not cached. The end. <laughs> it's great. Um, and the way you validate the cache is you change the template. So it's very, very simple to understand. It, it's, it's, it doesn't accomplish all the exact same goals, but uh, it gets you pretty far. Um, just as proof, here's me detracing Phoenix and watching it build its responses, and you can see writev is showing us that it is, in fact, uh, uh, it, we are using writev in, in, in writing this response to a socket. And this is a really contrived uh, web response that I did just for, for this. Um, what I highlighted in red here was a chunk that I saw as being exactly the same as on the previous response. So the whole doc type HTML opening chunk of the web page, it returns the exact, it says go back to the same place in memory you did last time a user requested this page and send them the same piece of data. Um, and then the blue chunks, uh, you can see that they're the exact same multiple times within the same response. Um, so what actually ends up happening here, uh, Kind of like the file example, we never actually build the full completed web page in the memory of the beam. 
The only place it actually gets built is in the, um, the socket buffer where we're actually sending this back over TCP. Um, and then, of course, TCP is going to send it out in packets and throw it away as it gets done with it. Um, but it's not our problem. We never have to allocate that memory. Um, and it's, it's every time a user requests the page, we're going to point them back to the same header string as the previous user. So this is really efficient and cool. And, and, and this kind of stuff actually matters um, in that you can actually, um, you can actually enlarge web pages in a Rails app. You can run into situations where the rendering time is a significant amount of your response time. And the fact that, that Phoenix views render so quickly and efficiently um, that it's not having to uh, continually copy strings to build up a giant string, it's not having to, uh, to uh, uh, build that up just so that it can do this right, uh, saves us a lot of effort um, and it saves us a, a lot of performance. So the moral of this is basically, when you're doing I.O., use I.O. lists. Um, now, there are, there are several caveats to this. I'm going to try to elaborate on this in a blog post pretty soon on the Big Nerd Ranch blog, so, so make sure and check that out, because um, there's more than we can cover here. Um, when you're passing uh, I.O. lists across processes, uh, small, like the non-ref ref counted strings, the smaller strings, are going to get combined. Um, and uh, when you're doing uh, 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 raw mode, uh, when, when you're writing to a file, you have to use raw mode in order to take advantage of write B. Um, uh, but, but these are details that uh, are probably more than you really have to care about on, on a normal basis. Um, what you should take away from this is, if you're doing I.O., use I.O. less. It's not going to hurt you, and it may help. And there's no point in actually going through and joining those strings yourself. That's it. Thanks for listening.